first thing I want to start with is by acknowledging um, my colleagues that are not here, the research team that I work with at Sultan Kabuz University. Um, these guys uh, are working on the settlement at Dahua, and uh, the work I'm uh, working, the, the work I'm focusing on is the mortuary landscape. So these two things inform each other, so of course I need to... Um, if you're not going to use the mic, could you speak a little louder? Of course I need to... Um, is that okay? So I just want to acknowledge um, my colleagues here. So the early Bronze Age in Omar, or on the Omar Peninsula, um, this time period is characterized by two periods, the Hafid period, roughly 3200 to 2700 BC, and the Ibn Arab period, which runs approximately 2700 or 2500 to 2000 BC. We characterize these two periods by looking at the Hafid period as a time when people were largely pastoralists, they were probably a semi nomadic people, few settlements, there is some evidence of settlements that's emerging in, in archaeological projects now, but for the most part, we don't know where people were living, how they were living, but we know that they had many, many hundreds of thousands of small-scale monuments for the dead. This is contrasted with the Umar period, where we see the first evidence of oasis settlements. We see monumental architecture, and this includes towers, habitation buildings, industrial buildings, and monumental tombs. So to give you an idea, of, a visual idea of the monuments from the Habib period, this is uh, one of the sites I work at in Vang. And you can see all of these, uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of these small, uh, small cairns that are on the landscape. Another view at Akhubei. Also at Al Khubay, you can see many of these are built on the fingers of these foothills going into the wadis. But they're also at very high locations. And many people theorize that these were placed at these high locations in order to be visible by people walking along the landscape in order to claim access to certain resources, to sort of claim the landscapes. Certainly, they're visible from great distances. And we can infer many things about the spirituality involved with burying the dead and turning the dead in these monuments at such high locations in the landscape. This is a, an iconic view of the UNESCO World Heritage Site at that of Cliff and Nell Ayn. And I'll point out that while these tombs look very nice in comparison, for example, these, the same idea. The type of stone available locally is different, so that um, results in differential preservation. So the Umanar period. The Umanar period we can characterize um, by having certain elements emerging for the first time. We see ceramic production, local ceramic production for the first time. We also see an increase in trade from different regions. Certainly there was trade of ceramics prior to this time, but the, uh, in this talk, especially, we want to emphasize the trade with the Indus Valley. At this time, we see much more intense contact with people from these regions, back and forth, primarily probably for the exchange of copper on the Amman Peninsula in exchange for goods that were available elsewhere. We see monumental towers for the first time. And these are the topic of many other people's projects. The function of these is still not completely well understood. There's a reconstruction at the site of Tel Brock. And people um, are examining uh, what it means if you have more than one tower at a site, if you have um, towers in relation to other types of industry, um, if you have no towers at a site. The Dahla site, for example, has no towers. No the other thing we see, especially on the monumental tombs, is uh, the appearance of art. Certainly there's rock art that exists prior to this period, but we start to see these carvings on the stones of the monumental tombs. This one right here is from the tomb I'll be discussing today at Bahama. And that brings us to the tombs. So prior to this time, people were interred in these small cairns up on the hillside. Maybe one person per cairn, maybe up to five or seven people per cairn. 
we see in the Amunar period that these large monumental structures are built with that are cut, the stone is cut nicely, they're beautiful, they're placed in central places in the landscape, and many, many hundreds of people go into these camp, into these monuments. We also see in this center diagram here that while some of the Amunar tombs have just one large chamber, or one relatively large chamber, Many of them have a complex internal architecture, so multiple chambers that may or may not communicate with one another, and then it, that imply a more complex mortuary ritual uh, being performed at this time. Here's an example from the site of the We can see in the background one of the reconstructed uh, tombs with the white ashlar, and we can see in the foreground uh, what is left after excavation of one of the less complex tombs. An overhead is the same tune. And another feature we start to see during this time is the use of burial pits. So we will um, talk about this in a minute, but very briefly, people were interred first in the Ubinar tombs, and then through a series of rituals were interred, in some cases, in burial pits. So specifically, what we can piece together at this time is that First, you have a decision-making process where these monuments are built, the stones are, are cut or selected, there's a decision about the number of chambers that are built, that are used inside the, the tomb, possibly there's a carved relief on the outside of the tomb, there's a decision about whether or not the tomb should be single-story or double-story, then you start to use the tomb, people were interred in these tombs, the material culture is interred with them, over time, and we're not sure the length of this ritual, but over time people start to manipulate the, the bones that are in the tomb by breaking apart the skeletons and, and moving certain um, bone elements in certain locations. The bones are broken. Um, sometimes you see them cut, probably in order to break them to move them around the tomb, or maybe accidentally in the, in the process of moving around the around the tomb. Sometimes you see burning inside the tomb, sometimes in specific parts of tombs, sometimes it's less clear. Finally, in some cases, but not all, there's evidence of people then being moved from the tombs into a burial pit that's outside of the, the tomb itself. It's invisible in the landscape. It's not marked by any stone structure. And then there are, there's often burning events that happen there as well. So on the Amman Peninsula, this map shows you the location of the published or well-studied tombs. Certainly there are many more, there are many tombs that haven't been discovered, certainly. Many of the white ashlar stones from these tombs are stolen or are taken to build other buildings throughout the thousands of years since these tombs fell out of use. The green dots on the slide show you the location of sites that have documented tomb, like a tomb or tombs, but without a bone pit. And then the, the black dots are sites that have shown that there's a bone pit associated with the tombs. An important uh, thing to, to notice here is that while the green dots here with just tombs, even though there's no pit, bone pit, documented in these sites, it could well be that they just haven't been discovered, that it's hidden. Or it could be that they didn't um, use that part of the ritual. <clears throat> so, I'm coming here today to speak uh, from a mortuary archaeology perspective. One important thing to consider when we're thinking in these terms is that the mortuary, that mortuary practices tell us more about the living than the dead. We often think about the structures that the dead are interred in, and we, we make inferences about how important or how, um, how important an individual may have been based on what the size of their the monument or what's interred with them. But actually, it's the living that make the decisions about what goes into the mortuary monuments in most cases. So these mortuary rituals provide an opportunity for the living to create, to negotiate, and to reinforce relationships. Key questions that we ask are, how are the dead treated after death, and why? This can range from very simple treatment where a, a person is interred, or it could be elaborate treatment where the person is interred and then revisited many times, like in the Umanar period. We ask, who is an ancestor? 
It's easy to assume that all of the dead are ancestors, but in fact, in ritual practice, only few of the dead actually reach the status of ancestors. And so we ask the question, what can we tell? Who can we tell? Was it an ancestor or who is just part of the dead? We ask, what is the function of the mortuary ritual? Are there, is there a belief system in place where the body needs to be treated a particular way in order for a certain outcome from a spiritual sense? We ask, what is the role of memory? So is the ritual that we're observing a way to in reinforce memories, to create memories in the society so that people remember stories or, or lineages or histories of their people? And we ask, what is the function of the material culture in terms? Is it just that an important person will have many things, or do the things themselves have a history that we should interrogate? So the Dahala site. Why is this site important? So you can see here that, unfortunately, this, um, the, the, click, the laser doesn't um, show up on the screen, so I will quickly show you this. The Dahala site is in this stretch of the Batany coast where there's no other documented Umanar site. So the Dahala site is important because it's the first of its kind to be examined systematically in this region. On the surface and in the settlement buildings, there is the, so far we've documented the largest amount of Indus ceramics. So ceramics coming from vessels traded with the Indus Valley. The largest number of Indus ceramics documented thus far on the Yama Peninsula. There are no monumental towers as there are in many lunar sites. There are 62 buildings that we've documented and evidence of large scale copper smelting. As I said, evidence of intensive trade in the Indus Valley. And this location is, an, is optimal to serve as a potentially a regional redistribution center for goods traded from afar. You see that the site is 24 kilometers approximately from the port of Saham. And here are some photographs of the, the site, uh, the buildings at the site of DH1. You can see here the mountains in the background. The site is very close to the entrance of Wadi Hevi, which would have given an, um, an entrance, uh, a way to go through the Al Hajar Mountains to get to sites like Yangho, Bat, uh, Dunk, etc. And you can also see the modern road that is here dividing the site. Certainly, some of the buildings were destroyed in the modern construction, but also a way to think about this is this modern road is probably placed along where the ancient road would have been, so we can see the importance of the location of the site. We're still working on modeling trade throughout the Amman Peninsula from Bahua, uh, but some ideas are that it would have served, as I said, as a, in an optimal location to redistribute goods traded from overseas. Here's a drawing that shows you the distribution of the different sites. When we overlay that in Google Earth, we can see uh, DH1, DH5, 8, 6, and 7. We use this out of convenience. This is one community. And we use these monikers in order to talk about different locations. We know from uh, the settlement that it was established sometime between 2500 and 2400 BC, and it appears to have fallen out of use around 2000 BC. My work is focused on two Umanar tombs at the site, one at DH5, which is a small and heavily wooded tomb, and primarily uh, a large tomb at DH7, which is, it appears to be completely untouched. Very quickly, this is the small Umanar tomb at uh, DH5, six meters in diameter. This is relatively small. It's heavily disrupted by root activity. All of the stones from the exterior have been robbed. Very few individuals are interred. And there's very little material culture. So it's very likely that this was um, looted over the years. It's very close to the road and an easy, easy target for the day. The tomb we will focus on today is tomb one at DH7. You can see here from this photograph, it's positioned on a low foothill, which is an unusual site for a new winter tomb. It's not unheard of, but it is unusual. Usually it's in a flat location closer to the buildings of the settlement. So it's not uh, unique, 
but it is unusual that the distance from the rest of the settlement and the high place it occupies, we can see the wadi below where we believe that the ancient people were practicing an agricultural economy in addition to copper smoking. So from the settlement, we know that there's very significant regional and international trade relationships, most specifically with the Indus Valley. The, the ceramic assemblage tells a story of more intense interaction than most other sites on the Iman Peninsula. A recent master's thesis by a Sultan Qaboos University student, Samia al Shaksi, uh, showed that 72% of the ceramics are from Indus rather than local, which is a, a very large number compared to other sites in the region. The peak of this exchange appears to have occurred during the first half of the Iman period. So my question is, is this visible in the mortuary record? That leads us to two more. So this is the actual stone with the carved relief that was on the outside of this uh, monumental tomb. We haven't found the matching one yet, but hopefully in the future. A quick view of the tomb in the process of excavation. You'll see that the walls are not standing any longer above ground. The tomb is two meters sub it has a two meter deep subterranean chamber, the entire tomb. The, the walls above ground aren't standing anymore. But unlike many tombs where they were completely stolen and used for other monuments, here the stones appear to have fallen to the side of the uh, tomb. And so I will show you that in a moment. You can see here. This row of white ashlar stone. This is a common feature that we've seen at this tomb where the stone simply fell forward as the building eroded. So, close up of this. And you see this from a view from the wadi. The, the stones of the building over the thousands of years since it fell out of use have fallen along the sides rather than completely being stolen. So, when you go to the site, there's many, many of the blocks that were used to build the tomb still there. Another view of the tomb, this is from a hill higher than the tomb, and I point this out right here, this is the tomb, and you can see the rest of the site here from this location as well. And a photograph of the tomb uh, from an approaching drone. The white on the, in the photograph are the sand bags we were going to use to fill the tomb after we finish the excavation. So we've completed excavation now of the tomb. We know that there are six chambers and a corridor. The diameter of the tomb is 8.5 meters. Like I said, uh, the chambers are two meters deep. We don't know if there was any structure above ground, like a second story of the tomb. But what we can say here is that you see these large stones here and here and here and here. These are the roof stones. These are very heavy stones. They would have formed a flat roof on top. It could be that there's another story on top of that, like there are many other sites, but we have no evidence of that. So thus far, we're not interpreting it that way. Many of these stones we were not able to move because they were extremely heavy. So now I will switch. Now you can see this overhead. You can see chamber A, B, C, D, E, and F. Chamber F was not excavated because of one of these large stones. Part of chamber B was not excavated for the same reason. And pay particular attention to chamber C, which has uh, the original wall that ends approximately here. I think you can see, well, you can't see with that arrow. The original wall ends around here, and a later wall was built to close this chamber. You can see it's slightly curved. And that will be important in our discussion later of how the monument was used over time. The closest parallel we found is um, Tomb A in Ajman, in Ajman. although it, there are differences, especially with the orientation of uh, the Dahma tomb. The Dahma tomb is not exactly, the corridor doesn't run perfectly north-south, um, and so that the orientation is slightly different and the Ajman tomb was slightly uh, disturbed by modern construction, so we're not 100% that it's the same exact structure. I'm going to switch out now to um, show you a um, video of the reconstruction of the monument. We're experimenting with photogrammetry and virtual reality programs to demonstrate 
to try to use these reconstructions to teach about the monuments, to teach about um, how they were used over time. So this is a video capture of one of the 3D um, reconstructions where you can see each of the chambers and we can zoom in, and especially in the virtual reality program, an individual can stand there and be a, if they can have the experience as though they're standing inside the tomb and see each of these chambers. So here we see uh, the orientation is changing, so you can see into the corridor. This is chamber B that's being zoomed in on. <coughs> And now we're turning around, we're looking now at chamber F, which is still closed. It's not showing it. I wound up creating the very high resolution model, which then isn't uh, viewable on most computers. So it's a bit of a of an issue. But what we're using this for is, a, is to teach people about the architecture of the monuments. And this was placed in a virtual reality program so that students could uh, see what it's like to be inside of the tomb when they're standing in Philadelphia or Washington or anywhere and understand the, the, the experience of being there. So here we can, we're seeing, this is right about where you stopped me, we're seeing the view going, looking down the corridor. We're turning now to look at Chamber E, which is right here in the middle, fully excavated. Chamber F, which was not excavated because of a large roof stone that's still standing there. Another large roof stone that we've left in because of the size. And now we'll zoom out and we will look at Chamber C, which is the chamber that was closed at some point after the initial construction of the monument. We don't understand why this happened, why they did this. Um, in a few moments, I'll tell you the, about the differences of what I found inside of that chamber versus the other ones. Uh, so now I will stop this and try to go back into PowerPoint. So the preliminary inventory of 2-1. We have 70,992 fragments of bone, right? So lots of little fragments of bone. Some of these are in very poor condition, some are in excellent condition. Everything's fragmented and commingled. So, so far we have a little bit of evidence of burning inside the tomb, which is a common feature in UNR tombs, but very little of this tomb. Um, we see cut marks on the bones. Now, the way to think about this is not so much that people are cutting up corpses, but rather they're being broken as they're moved through the chambers, after, well after skeletonization. We see, so far we have an inventory of at least 63 archaeologically complete vessels, about 4,000 more shirts to look at. We have a, a, the local uh, fine redware that you see in all women our sites. We have a very large amount of Indus or Indus-like ceramics and a, a small bit of other imports like Iranian insights gray rare. We have the typical collection of soft stone vessels. Here's a, some photographs of that. These are very typical. These are not unusual for women our sites. We do have um, one vessel that's rather interesting that I'd like to show people and ask what you think these animals are. I will um, again try to uh, show you a quick video. I will, the, the point of showing this video is that uh, when we were looking at this vessel, which you will see in a moment, initially we thought that we were seeing snakes on the vessel. And it wasn't until we put it into the photogrammetry program and modeled it and could look at it in a different light and twirl it around and look at it like this. And this is not a completed, you'll see at the top, it's not a completed model, but we could see the, the very light incised figures here much better and could see that they're, it's not a snake. Um, and in fact, it's two animals facing each other, maybe dogs. Does anyone see that? Maybe dogs? So the, it shows you one of the utilities is instead of just making these nice models that we twirl around and wow people with, it's actually helping the science because we're able to 
highlight different um, different parts. Wow. Got a lot going on on my desktop here. Um, so the soft stone collection is typical for all of it, compared with all other Uminar sites in the region. We have very few copper bronze objects. Here's one, one of these objects. We have two of these copper bronze spatulas. These were very fragmentary, so the best photo we have is actually this field photograph of using a sharpie as a scale. We have six silver rings, which is an interesting find. This, this one in particular is probably later, uh, uh, probably from a cairn that was built on top of the tomb and fell inside at some point, but we're not positive. We have three bronze rings and five Indus ivory or bone combs. And these were interesting because, again, they're very fragmentary, so these are in, in the in situ photographs. Here's what they may have looked like when they were in good condition. This is from the site of Sabu. So if you look back, you can see the, the teeth of the comb and very, it's difficult to see, but you see the, the double circle dot design that's very typical for the time period. <clears throat> that leads us to the corridor. In the corridor is where we found these five of his cones associated with skulls. And so what we were able to determine is that despite the fact that these tombs are used to move people through the chambers and they're broken up as that happens, at this one location in the corridor, we determined that this was the entrance. It may well be that at the other side of the tomb that there was another entrance, but this one was certainly used for the longest period of time. Here we can see evidence of multiple plastering events and a large flat stone placed on top of the interred skeletal remains as a step. The benefit of this is that we were able to see uh, the activities in the tomb in between each of these plastering events, and in between two of the events, were the placement of primary interments, which is very unusual. And that is where we found the skulls with the ivory combs together. So, that, so it's unusual for us, where everything else is broken, to find this kind of a feature. So another thing we could tell is that this wall that was built to close chamber C happened um, before the plaster events. So theoretically, if we can date the bone, are the objects that's, that are in between the plastering events. We could tell the time that chamber C was closed. We see the primary interments embedded in these plastering events. And here is a sort of a cartoon that shows you the last plastering event. This is the last event. There were interments underneath of this. Here's the first event right here, this unexcavated part. And this is, these are the interments that happened after the first plaster event. Bone and material culture are embedded in the plaster step. And so we are currently analyzing what we can tell between these events. Moving on, after placement in the tomb and movement through the tomb, the Dahla site also has a bone pit that was used. And here is the overhead photo from the drone. You can see the bone pit right here at the edge of the photo. Here's a close-up of that. Sorry for the technical. Here's our close-up. <clears throat> when we first were excavating the tomb, we weren't aware that there was a bone pit. This was revealed as we cleared the area around the tomb. Here in the foreground, you can see where we started to see evidence of a bone pit. There looks like there may have been some stones that marked this area, but it is, as I mentioned earlier, an invisible feature. This, as we uncovered it, we started to see a very dense area of bone and material culture. I had some excellent students who um, painstakingly excavated this feature with brushes uh, in very um, controlled loci so that we have a very good understanding of when 
each of the deposits were made. Here you can see the mixing of material culture and bone, both burned and unburned bone. And an in-progress photograph, moving on to a profile. We excavated the bone pit in this way so that we could understand how many deposits were made into the bone pit. So how many times were, was the tomb emptied and placed where the contents placed into this bone pit? We've established that there were at least five deposits. Uh, and at the conclusion, at the bottom of the pit, we were able to tell there was a burning event when the bone pit was initially dug. There was a burning event on one side of it, some human skeletal remains were burned in that location. And then elsewhere in the pit, at different times, there were additional burning events, probably ritual rather than uh, intending to cremate the bones and reduce their size. We see very hot, the center is a very hot burning, and then radiating heat and steam that affect the bone moving outward. It's not clear if there are certain types of bone that are more or less burned. We know that people were dividing up skeletal elements in, in a large tomb, so it's not clear if then the burning uh, happened when certain elements were put into the bone pit. From the side view, you can see that the burning events happened at two times in addition to the first burning event when the pit was initially dug. And it looks like after two deposits, there's a burning event. After two deposits, there's another burning event. These bone pits and the burning of the skeletal remains are not unique to Dahua. We also see this at Ross Hill Jins, for example, where they have three bone pits. We see this at Bat, we see this at Hilly. Uh, so this is not unique, but the, the important thing about the Dahua site is that uh, because of the seemingly untouched context, we might be able to establish more information about the mortuary ritual that people were using. If we look at the different chambers and the bone pit, we see that far more skeletal elements are present in the bone pit compared to all of the chambers. So we know that the bone pit was used repeatedly and that the tombs, the, this, the cessation of the use of the tomb stopped while some people were still in process, if you will, in the ritual, moving people through the tomb into the bone pit. So forgive me, the, in turning on and off these PowerPoints, we have one with the the older version of the slide. So I believe that the bone pit had 89,313, something like that, skeletal elements. Again, ranging from poor to excellent condition. Again, evidence of burning and cut marks. Um, this is again a, a typo of this on this slide, no evidence of primary interments. There is, as of last summer, some evidence of primary interments, but only a couple and only individuals that have traumatic injuries, which I will discuss at the end of the presentation. There is no evidence of articulations, so this gives us the sense that people were not being placed directly into the bone pit as they are in other sites on the Amon Peninsula. In the bone pit, we have 41 complete ceramic vessels and another 500 or so insurance to examine. The same kind of assemblage, local wares, and imported wares from Indus and other uh, foreign locations. The same kind of soft stone vessels that we see in the tomb. And again, a very small number of special finds. So only five beads were found in the bone pit, which I will discuss later as being interesting. Uh, very few pieces of copper and bronze, three copper bronze rings, and one silver ring, few marine shells, bottom teeth, and fragments of an ivory in this comb like we saw in the tomb. Here are some images of the soft stone vessels that we found in the bone pit and the ceramics. So we see imported or imported light. Uh, ceramics in both the contexts. I say imported light because there's some evidence, um, some scholars are suggesting that there might be a local industry for creation of these uh, ceramics on the Amman Peninsula, but it's, it's not yet um, well established. Here we have more imported or imported like ceramics. Another important find at the Dahua site 
tomb in Lohmit are inscribed in this inscribed vessels. We have at least three of these in this context. Again, not unique, but the number of, of inscribed vessels is, um, is unique. We'll skip over that video for now, I'll show you at the end. Um, we see it, the, the ceramic assemblage is currently under analysis, but again, we see local luminar wares, large amount of Indus ceramics, and a small amount of other imported vessels. A typical soft stone assemblage. Special finds, which include a very small number of copper and bronze objects, which is strange to us given the large amount of copper production at the site. A very small number of beads. Most other sites, women are tombs and bone pits, report hundreds or thousands of beads in the tomb and bone pit. We uh, were very careful to screen everything in, uh, three times in, in these contexts, and so we're very certain that we did not miss small beads in this context. So, we think that this is an alteration in the mortuary ritual at this particular site where less items like this are being interred with these people. We've seen multiple plaster events and the closing of the chamber. So this gives us some indication about the way the tomb is refurbished over time, the way that the use of it may have changed, perhaps closing a chamber for some special uh, interred individual, or perhaps closing the use of that uh, chamber in the mortuary ritual for all people. Uh, evidence from the skeletons. This again is also under underway. The bones are highly fragment, fragmented and we want to understand where there are primary interments. At other sites on the Iman Peninsula you see primary interments at the very end of the use of the monuments and at the very end of the use of the bone pit. We don't see that at the Hala. Uh, we do see two or three individuals with very significant traumatic injuries placed into the bone pit. We see primary interments in the closed chamber C, and we see primary interments under the plaster in the corridor step. And this is just to remind you of what that corridor step and the plaster look like. So future work. We will continue the analysis of the material culture. We want to understand if the mortuary record also demonstrates the same overrepresentation in Indus ceramics. We want to understand the social practices that produced the material culture, culture assemblage of the settlement and those that created the material culture assemblage of the mortuary context. We want to explore what these items mean in terms of identity of the individuals um, and those who were interred of the identity of those who in, were interred and those who did the interring. The full osteological analysis will be available after the summer, including a demographic profile of the people, pathology. Uh, current MNI indicates we had at least 152 people interred in its uh, context, but that is an extremely preliminary number. We have isotope analyses that are underway to understand if the individuals interred in the tomb were local to the Amman Peninsula or perhaps represent the remains of people who were trading with this settlement. With radiocarbon analyses, we want to establish the timing of the refurbishment of the tomb, and we want to uh, experiment with some of the skeletal remains that are partially burned to try to understand if we can establish the length of the mortuary ritual by examining bone that is both burned and unburned. So say a long bone where one side is burned and one side is not burned. The unburned side theoretically should give us the date of death of the individual, whereas the burned side theoretically should give us the event of burning. These may be too closely related in, in time for us to pull it apart, but we will be uh, trying to establish this. So material culture, tomb membership, and chronology. We know that there's a big difference in the way people were treated, the way the dead were treated between the Hafiz period and the Umanar period. So we are, are, what we know is that Umanar rituals demonstrate a shift in how people view the importance of the body and death. This includes a reorganization of the space where the living and the memory of the dead interact. So instead of having Monuments placed high on the hillside that you see from a distance. The tomb is close, close to or in the center of the settlement, and the bodies of the people interred are, are routinely revisited for manipulation of the body within the chambers. 
This is a new treatment of the body. It involves repeated processual interactions with the dead, where the body is reduced to smaller and smaller fragments, sometimes resulting in the placement of the dead in an invisible bone pit, and ending the ritual with symbolic burning. So we want to explore the question of does this emphasize or de-emphasize the importance of a common ancestral identity? Implications for Dahua. We know that there was intensive trade with foreign agents in Dahua. Um, so much so that the material culture assemblage on the site changed dramatically. It looks very different than other sites on the peninsula. But this didn't change the mortuary ritual that dramatically, except with one important modification, the internment of special small finds. So our, our preliminary conclusion is that this speaks to the strength of cultural continuity on the Amman Peninsula during the Lunar period, and in spite of clear, intense foreign uh, influence over the, the culture of, the, of this settlement. So thank you to everybody. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer.